For a really long time, we've been told implicitly that our depression and our anxiety are malfunctions. They're signs of being broken on the inside. And mostly, depression and anxiety are not malfunctions. They're signals that something isn't going right, either in your psyche or in the environment. And they're signals that we need to change. And what we need to do is stop insulting those signals by saying that they're a sign of weakness or craziness or purely biological malfunctions and instead listen to them. If you listen to the signal, you can find a solution. I am joined by Johan Hari, author of Lost Connections. Johan, welcome to the show. Oh, it's great to be with you, Chris. You're also a very rare instance of a person who said my name right first time. I once waited for six hours with a broken arm in casualty because they were calling for Joanna Harry to come forward. <laughs> so I'm always so happy when people can get it right first time. Yeah, I think... Um, I've said your name or heard it on podcasts and interviews sufficiently for me to know what it is. Um, so for the people who are listening, you should have already heard me say Johan's name. Uh, is, <laughs> as, far as, I'm con- as far as I'm concerned, Lost Connections, your book, is the 80-20 way to understand everything you need to know about depression. I think you should be incredibly proud of it. Oh, thank you. I'm uh, I'm really chuffed by that, and I'll start paying you commission. The more yeah, the honest, more times you name drop it, there you go. I swear to God, I must have sent it to twenty, thirty people, and most of them are going to be listening. Um, <laughs> so first questions first. Your book's been out for what two and a half, three years now, something like that. Something like that. Um, let me think. January two years ago. Yeah, so t- two and a bit years. Yeah. Got you. Why is it back in the charts now? Then, apart from the fact that it's great, but why is it back in the charts now? It's a really interesting question. I've been thinking about it a little bit. I've been sort of in a slight frenzy finishing another book and um, and actually almost certainly got coronavirus. So I've been a little bit out of it. And I've been thinking a lot about the the, the themes of the book and, and why they're really resonating with people at the moment. So I guess I should just say what the book is about and then, and then just, just very briefly, which is really the book was the thing that impelled me to write the book was that there were these two mysteries that I was thinking about a lot of the time. Uh, The first mystery is I'm 41 years old and all throughout my life, depression and anxiety have increased in Britain, in the US and across the Western world. Right. And so has anxiety. And I wanted to understand, well, why? Right. Why is this happening to us? Why is it that with each year that passes more and more of us are feeling depressed and anxious? What's going on? And I wanted to understand that for a more personal reason, which is that when I was a teenager, uh, I went to my doctor. I explained that I was very depressed. I was quite ashamed of it. And my doctor told me a story that I I now know wasn't totally wrong, but was really oversimplified. My doctor said, well, we know why people get like this. Some people just have a natural problem in their brain, right? Got an imbalance. You're clearly one of them. All you need to do is take a load of drugs. You're going to be fine, right? So they gave me an antidepressant called Paxil or Siroxat. It's got different names. And it did give me some relief. But for most of the 13 years that I took it, I was still depressed. And at the end of it, I was asking, well, what's going on here, right? And for, for the book Lost Connections, I ended up going on a big journey all over the world. I met the leading experts in the world about depression and anxiety and people who have just very different perspectives on this, as you know, from an Amish village, because the Amish have very low levels of depression, to a city in Brazil that banned advertising to see if that would make us feel better, to a lab in Baltimore where they're giving people psychedelics to see if that helped. Ask me afterwards. And um, I think the heart of what I learned is there's scientific evidence for nine different causes of depression and anxiety. Two of them are, in fact, in our biology, right? There are real changes that happen in your brain when you become depressed that can make it harder to get out, and your genes can make you more sensitive to these problems. But most of the factors that cause depression and anxiety and make us feel like shit are not in our biology. They're factors in the way we live. And once you understand them, that opens up a very different set of solutions. The reason I started to set it up to think about it is a lot of the factors that I learned there's strong scientific evidence for that cause depression and anxiety have been supercharged to fuck in the last five weeks or whatever it is since this began for a lot of us, right? So to give some very obvious examples, financial insecurity causes depression and anxiety. Now that in some ways seems like a no shit Sherlock insight, right? If you'd said to my nan or your nan, you know, do you think if you're really financially insecure, you're going to be more or less likely to be depressed? My grandmother would have clipped me around the ear and said stop fucking wasting my time right she was scottish that's nice that's a good that's a good scottish accent the that closest, i'm impressed man uh it's the closest i can get to it yeah, you know but, but um uh, the 
I can say a lot about Scottish accents later if you want, but the, uh, all my, um, not because of my nan, but because of my mother, all my um, negative thoughts in my head, because my mother's a very positive person in many ways, but also very negative, um, uh, happen in a Scottish accent. So That's whenever, hilarious. Whenever, like, whenever I feel I'm fucking up, I'm like, what you're doing, you cunt. What you're doing? <laughs> But, uh, what the fuck is this? I got but, to, uh, I got to interject there. Um, Alanda Botton, one of my favorite philosophers, says but, yeah. every every bad inside voice was once an outside voice. Isn't it so <laughs> interesting that you've got a signature that is is like embedded from something that's outside this disciplinarian, this past grandfathered in, archived in, right from from this old sort of era, perhaps where you were disciplined more, and that's now that's what's re re coming yeah. back. That's true, because both my parents have, uh, I've had to say foreign accents, because my mum does regard Scotland as a foreign country. Um, so whenever she's really pissed off with me, the only time I've ever made my mother truly angry with anything I've ever written was once, um, I was, it must have been, when was it, 2004, I was in New York um, covering something. And for a play on the Sting song, I called myself an Englishman in New York. My mother phoned me the next day and was like, no fucking son of mine is an Englishman, you cunt. You forgot <laughs> what you did to Mel Gibson. Fuck you. you. Disowned. Even now, when she's really pissed off at me, she'll go, oh, is that my English son, is oh, it? Oh, God. So, Isn't it? <laughs> Mothers can keep grudges like no That's one true. else. Very true. But, the, but so you think about that in relation to financial insecurity, right? Like my grandmother... And my mother would have actually regarded that as so obvious an insight. It'd be like, why the fuck are you wasting my time, right? Um, so, but if anyone does need scientific evidence for it, there is plenty. People who have a private income from property are 10 times less likely to develop uh, serious anxiety than people who don't. Doesn't mean there aren't lots of other causes of anxiety. Doesn't mean rich people can't get anxious, obviously. Um, and obviously, there's been a big increase in financial insecurity over the last uh, five weeks. For reasons again so obvious, I don't need to tell your viewers, that is causing a lot of depression and anxiety. And one thing I'm finding quite frustrating at the moment is seeing uh, people who, uh, some of them I know, they're all good and admirable people, but people who run mental health charities that, you know, brought on on the news or celebrities, they're brought on on the news and they said, what should people do about their anxiety and depression? And almost always they say, well, they should meditate, they should switch off the news. Um, it's all individual solutions, right? And I'm in favour of all those things. I'm in favour of meditation. I'm not watching the news 24 hours a day myself because I would go mental. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not dissing any of those things. But that is so limited a set of solutions as to be insulting. If you are worried how you're going to pay your rent next week, next month, if you are worried uh, how you're going to feed your kids, how you're going to... you're and it goes to the heart, I think what I think is the most important insight of what I learned in the research for Lost Connections, which is for a really long time, we've been told implicitly, it's not the goal of anyone to communicate this to us, but implicitly, we've been told that our depression and our anxiety are malfunctions, right? They're like they're signs of being broken on the inside. And mostly depression and anxiety are not malfunctions. They're signals, right? They're signals that something isn't going right, either in your psyche or in the environment. And they're signals that we need to change. And what we need to do is stop insulting those signals by saying that they're a sign of weakness or craziness or purely biological malfunctions. And instead, listen to them. Because if you listen to the mal, if you listen to the signal, you can find a solution. And it's not like there aren't solutions to financial insecurity, right? What the British government has done, um, you know, they've done some good things in this. They've certainly been better than the US in terms of financial support. But, you know, the 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 um, the single best, if you look at, okay, let's look at El Salvador, right? El Salvador is one of the poorest countries in the world. I've been there. It's staggeringly poor. The government of El Salvador has cancelled everyone's rent and everyone's utility bills till this crisis is over, right? Now, there's no one watching your podcast who's going to doubt that people are going to be a shit ton less anxious in El Salvador. Now they know they don't have to worry about their rent and their utility bills, right? Um, the, a big part of what I'm arguing is we need to expand our idea of what an antidepressant is, right? Anything that reduces depression and anxiety should be seen as an antidepressant. For some people, that will include drugs. Uh, but precisely because these problems go deeper than our biology, the solutions need to go deeper than our biology too. So... <clears throat> I mean, I'm happy to talk about other, th other 
causes of depression and anxiety mm. that have risen in this crisis. But the single best solution to financial insecurity in this crisis, which is the single best solution to depression and anxiety for a lot of people in this crisis, I would argue is what's called a universal basic income. They're basically doing it in Spain. It's, it's much less bureaucratic than what we're doing. It's where everyone in the country is given just a basic income. You're not going to be having any, you know, you're not going to be ordering caviar on a basic income. And there's lots of evidence that that reduces depression and anxiety. When they tried it in Canada in the 1970s, they chose a town. They said to everyone in that, not everyone, sorry, they said to a large number of people in that town, from now on, we're giving you a basic income. Uh, there's nothing you have to do for it. And there's nothing you can do that means we'll take it away. It was a small amount of money. It wasn't, you, uh, I think it was the equivalent of about £9,000 in today's money. So you're not going to be able to live well on £9,000. But equally, you're not going to be homeless with £9,000, right? Um, and lots of things happened. Almost nobody gave up work, which I think is really interesting. But um, the single biggest effect is there was a massive fall in depression and anxiety, right? Um, massive fall. Uh, in fact, mental illnesses that were so severe that people had to be shut away in psychiatric hospitals fell by 9% very rapidly. That, you think you they're, find... they're the most acute cases, right? Exactly. Um, and, and, and so I think, um, and that, that should help us to understand one of the reasons, and I stress it's only one of many, and I'm sure we'll talk about others, why depression and anxiety have been rising throughout my lifetime and yours, right? There's been a big increase in financial insecurity throughout my lifetime, right? The middle class is fracturing and collapsing. Uh, you've got a lot of money going to the very rich and a lot more people being pushed down into insecurity. That causes depression and anxiety. And for those people to then go to their doctor and be told, oh, actually, it's just that there's something wrong in your brain is an insult to them. It's not that there aren't real biological factors that are, mm. but that's such a grossly simplifying solution, uh, explanation that it misses a lot of what's going on. And it means we miss out on the most important solutions. Yeah, it's um, like diet brain. So diet brain is anyone that's ever done a cut or has been trying to lose weight knows when you start to really drive your calorie deficit into the floor, all that you think about is food. All that you're thinking about is, oh God, that sweet potato really didn't fill me up. Or I wonder when I can next have my 10 calorie round trees jelly or whatever it might be. You can tell that I'm dieting at the moment as well. And um, it's the same, right? You know, it's the bottom, that bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's food, shelter, da, 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 da. And money is just a, a proxy for all of those things, right? Money is the, uh, the root cause of food, shelter, safety, blah, blah, blah. And um, yeah, without that, it's it's the thing. Anyone who's ever been skinned, you're just thinking, oh, fuck, I, this is a thought, <clears throat> and then at the end, there's an affix of, but I'm skinned. This is a thought, oh, but money worry. This is a thought, and it's the same with, this is a thought, but I'm hungry. This is a thought, but I'm hungry, and it's diet brain. Um, I've got. I, I've tried to summarize Lost Connections in one sentence. I'm going to see. Oh, go on, let me see. I'm going to see what you think. Your state of mind and mental health is much more under your control than you or the medical industry might think. I would ch only change one word in that, which is I would say our control, not your control. Uh, I, oh, nice. That's one letter. <laughs> that was one letter. Down, right? Fuck. You're one letter away. Because I do think it's important to explain to people that a lot of these problems can't be solved by us as isolated individuals. Some of them can. A lot of them can't. But they can be solved by us together as groups, right? Um, and so I would try to explain to people that um, we can regain control collectively over many of the things that have been fucking with us, that are making us, uh, some of us anxious and depressed, and a lot more of us a lot less happy than we otherwise would be, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, So, but I think that's a pretty good summary. I could Thank do that you. thing where David Bowie used to have a... Um, Used to have a, when he didn't want to turn up at concerts, he had a person who who he would sort of send out body to be a pretend David Bowie. Like, now, unfortunately, we're not exactly body yeah, doubles. I, I think I think that I could do. It. You get me a quiff. You get me a quiff and, and give me a slightly posher down down south accent, and I reckon I reckon I can make it work. Right. So um, you, you gained several stone, and uh, so, it's no, funny you say that about posh because my mum go back to my mother had accents. So but, um, both my parents were from very pretty poor backgrounds. And um, for some reason, even when I was a little boy, I had this weird posh voice, right? It's so funny when you watch our home videos, right? It's like my mum goes, I'm like five, and my mum goes, Johan, 
go and pick up that. And I go, certainly, mother, of course. I'd be happy <laughs> Where to. Where the fuck's this voice <laughs> come from? <laughs> so yeah. My mum wants to impersonate me. What she does is she goes, ya, 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 ya. <laughs> she once sent me, a, a, about a year ago, she sent me an email. And it said, um, oh, Johan, you're really good in this clip. And I thought, oh, she's watched something I've done. That's nice. So I clicked the clip. It was the fucking Queen's speech. Oh, uh, I <laughs> thought it was going to be uh, Made in Chelsea or something like that. And she says, oh, this is you on Made in Chelsea. Um, so I want to go high level for the people who yeah. haven't read Lost Connections. Can you just run us through the nine and the seven? Um, the, uh, sorry, the, um, the causes and the solutions. Just, just titles of that. And then I want to... Make it sound a bit weird. Can I talk about something that connects a lot of them? Yes. I think it would be a better way to yes. explain to people. Yes. So this is not, not true of all of them, but it's, it connects a lot of them. So everyone, and it goes, relates exactly to what you just said. So everyone knows they have natural physical needs, obviously, right? You need food, you need water, you need shelter, you need clean air. If I took those things away from you, you'd obviously be in trouble really quickly. But there's equally strong evidence that all human beings have natural psychological needs, right? You need to feel you belong. You need to feel you're connected to other people. You need to feel your life has meaning. You need to feel your work has meaning. You need to feel you've got a future that makes sense. And the culture that we've built is good at lots of things, right? I'm glad to be alive today. A lot of things are better than they were in the past. But we've been getting less and less good at meeting these deep, underlying psychological needs that people have a lot of them not all uh, and i think this is the key reason why depression and anxiety have, have have been going up and and you know there are loads of different people who explain this to me in all sorts of different ways but the moment when it really emotionally fell into place for me was when i went to interview this south african psychiatrist called dr derek summerfield he's an amazing guy and derek happened to be in cambodia in 2001 when they first introduced chemical antidepressants for the people in that country, because they never had them in Cambodia before. And the local doctors, the Cambodians, were like, well, what are these drugs? And he explained to them. And they said to him, oh, we don't need them. We've already got antidepressants. And, they, and he was like, what do you mean? And he thought they were going to talk about some kind of like herbal remedy, like, I don't know, Ginkgo biloba, St. John's wort, something like that. Instead, they told him a story there was a farmer in their community who uh, worked in the rice fields. And one day he stood on a landmine left over from the war with the Americans and he got his leg blown off. Um, so they gave him physical therapy. They gave him an artificial leg. And after a while, he went back to work in the rice fields. But apparently it's really painful to work underwater when you've got an artificial limb. And I'm guessing it's quite traumatic to go back and work in a field where you got blown up. The guy started to cry all day. After a while, he refused to get out of bed. He developed classic depression. This is when they said to, to Dr. Summerfield, well, that's when we gave him an antidepressant. And he said, what was it? And they explained that they went and sat with him. They listened to him. They realized that his pain made sense, right? It had causes in his life that actually when you sat down with him were entirely understandable. Um, one of the doctors figured after listening to him you know, if we bought this guy a cow, he could become a dairy farmer. He wouldn't be in this position that was fucking him up so much. So they bought him a cow. Within a couple of weeks, he stopped crying. Within a couple of months, his depression was gone. They said to Dr. Summerfield, so you see, doctor, that cow, that was an antidepressant. That's what you mean, right? Now, if you've been raised to think about depression the way we have, that sounds like a joke, right? I, I went to my doctor for an antidepressant. She gave me a cow. But what those Cambodian doctors knew intuitively is what the leading medical body in the whole world, the World Health Organization, has been trying to explain to us for years, right? If you're depressed, if you're anxious, you're not weak, you're not crazy, you're not in the, mach the main, a machine with broken parts, right? You're a human being with unmet needs. And what you need and deserve is support to get those deeper needs met. And the reason why I say our rather than your is because that farmer on his own could not have solved that problem right he needed people around him to help him figure out what had gone wrong and more importantly to think of a solution and build a solution with him and i think so many of the problems we face in a way you know when you explain these causes to people i mean let's think about another one a really obvious one that's risen in the last five weeks loneliness right it's not rocket science when you explain to someone if you're lonely you're more likely to become depressed right I remember, it's funny, I remember when 
I remember the night before my book came out, I was sitting with one of my best mates and we were talking about it. And, you know, when a book comes out, you, you always think about how people are going to react. And I said, I think most people are going to say, you know, obviously there's interesting stuff that people could learn and lots of stories and facts and people they won't know about in the book. But I thought some of the ideas, I thought they're going to go, well, no shit, Sherlock. Why the fuck did we, uh, what we needed you to tell us that loneliness and financial insecurity causes depression, right? Mm. This is really obvious. And then the book came out and I kept being introduced in radio interviews and things. We'll go, well, we're now going to talk to Johan Hari, who's written this incredibly controversial <laughs> new book. I, I want to I, I, I interject there, Johan. So two things. First thing being the best books tell you a story that you already know is a universal Atomic Habits by James Clear, one of the best books that I've read over the last few years. I knew everything that was in that book, but no one had synthesized it, put it across with those examples and put it in a single unit, right? That makes a big difference. Second thing, reason that I think people see Lost Connections as controversial is that it puts the locus of control onto the individual. From an individual's perspective, you're hearing stories of snowflake generation and helicopter parenting and all this sort of stuff, lack of sovereignty, lack of high agency, no upward mobility, people wanting the state, an increase in socialism and, and sort of leftist thought where people want the state to give them as much as they can and do the problems, fix the problems for them. I think it shines a bright light in a very ugly mirror onto some of the things that people are doing that can affect their own mood. Now, again, neither of us, both both of us have suffered depressive depressive episodes and depression in our lives. Neither of us are saying that depression is in, in uh, an easy mistress to bear, right? Like it is an existential crisis that feels like you're drowning in thought. Um, but being told that you have, that we have more control over our mental health than we might have thought makes you become the architect or more of the architect of your own suffering. And that's quite uncomfortable for people. It's interesting. I, I, I'm thinking about what you're saying because I think there's, I think I would put it slightly differently. I think it's, if you're given a story about your pain, right? Even if that story doesn't work very well, at least you feel like you know where you are, right? And what's called the biomedical model, which is basically just the idea that depression and anxiety are overwhelmingly biological, right? Biological flaws in you, in the individual. I think because people have been told that story for so long, it becomes, a, and it, I don't say this separately, for me, it became part of how I saw myself. It became part of how I, how I, um, how I understood the world inbuilt right yeah and if someone and by the way it's not that those insights are totally wrong right there are real biological factors but if someone comes along and says um that's true but actually and it's not just me saying this it's the leading medical body in the world the world health organization actually these problems are mostly social problems and we mostly need to deal with them together you know as individuals and as groups um it's very painful to make the transition from one story about your distress to another. Mm -hmm. it's, it's disorientating. The analogy I was I thought of, I think, when I was learning this, because it was destabilizing for me, was like, if you feel like you understand your pain, even if you feel like shit, but you understand it, to me, it's like there's a dog, a wild dog, but it's on a leash, right? And that moment of switching stories, of seeing that something much more complex, and I think interesting and empowering is going on, mm -hmm. is like a moment when the dog is let off the leash. Right. Mm -hmm. And and that's a very disorientating moment. But actually, I wanted to ask you about this, Chris, because I'm really interested in how you think about this. That, that I was thinking about this in relation to Love Island and reality TV. That I think for me, one of the interesting things I've been thinking about it a bit in the last few weeks, but obviously it's a big part of the book. Is I think one of the things we can get from this crisis is an understanding of what had gone wrong with our values. So there's. And this, for me, was one of the most challenging things that I learned about in the research for Lost Connections. And I could see how much it had played out in my own life. So um, 
everyone knows that junk food has taken over our diets and made us physically sick, right? As you can see from my chins, I'm not immune to this temptation. I'm really pissed off that KFC is, some KFCs have reopened, but not within a radi- delivery radius of me. <laughs> but the, um, but, but just like, uh, and it's funny, I got a message from someone on Facebook the other day who I hadn't seen in years and years, like literally about 20 years. And she said, I don't know if you remember, but when we were 16, we watched uh, uh, some horror film about the end of the world together. And we talked about what's the point in a collapse of civilization where we would all kill ourselves. And she said to me, you said it's when they shut all the branches of McDonald's and KFC and they stopped filming EastEnders. And she was like, oh, just so you know. The, that's two of the horsemen of the apocalypse. That's two, of the, that's two oh, of the horsemen of the apocalypse. Very bad sign. But, but so anyway, sorry, don't let me distract on that though. But the, so just like junk food, uh, you know, we all know junk food has taken over our diets and made us physically mm-hmm. sick. In a similar way, a kind of junk values have taken over our minds and made us mentally sick. So for thousands of years, philosophers have said, if you think life is about money and status and showing off, you're going to feel like shit, right? Um, but weirdly, nobody had actually scientifically tested this until an amazing man I got to know named Professor Tim Kasser who did a load of research I have to talk about, but the core of what he discovered is kind of two things. Firstly, the more you think life is about money and status and showing off beyond a baseline of financial security where you can provide for yourself, the more you think life is about money and status and showing off, the more likely you are to become depressed and anxious because it trains you to look for happiness in all the wrong places, right? You're not going to lie on your deathbed and think about all the likes you got on Instagram and all the shoes you bought, right? You're going to think about moments of meaning and connection and purpose in your life. The second thing he showed is that as a society, as a culture, we have become much more driven by these junk values, um, just much more. They've become really dominant. And, and I, I guess for me, one of the interesting things about this moment is it's a moment when we can really reappraise those values because um, it turns out when our backs were against the wall, who did we really need? Who were our key workers? Who's allowed to leave the house? It's not um, billionaires, right? It's not... um, Instagram influencers. It's not the people who are the biggest followers on Instagram, right? It's people like, my grandmother was a cleaner. She cleaned toilets. My dad was a bus driver. Um, My sister was a nurse. You know, it's it's people who who are doing the things that have been devalued for so long in this society and culture. And I want to ask you about that in relation to Love Islanders. One of the things that surprised me when the book came out was how many people um, who are reality show stars? I got a, <laughs> funny actually. There were three categories of people who I did not expect to contact me. Who I got a shit ton of messages from: um, WWE people, wrestlers, yep, got you. Yep. Uh, reality stars, and mm. porn stars. Right? Amazing. So interesting to me. That's the big Trans- three. Unfortunately, they were all female porn stars, which doesn't do anything for me. Oh, but uh, I know I was like, <laughs> "Where's all the gay porn stars who yeah. are?" Excuse me, I'm over here, Johan Hari. Here's my address. <laughs> Exactly, but um, the and it was interesting because what I'd get would I be get all these messages from people who, if you looked at their Instagram pages, looked like they had the most perfect life, best life. And they'd message me and go, "I'm suicidal. I read your book. I'm trying to think about this and this and this." And I'd be like, "Oh, so I'm just interested in your perspective on that, that those values and how how did that play out for you in relation to something like Love Island." Real interesting question, man. I've got about 20 different threads open in my mind, and I'm going to try and close them all before we, before we finish this podcast. So, um, firstly, I'm, I was very good friends with Sophie Graydon, who sadly passed away a couple of years ago, ex Love Island contestant. I'd known her for 10 years previously to that. We'd modeled together for a long time. Uh, Mike, uh, I didn't know personally, but knew sort of secondarily. Um, and people are associating that, those situations, the fact that, TV stars have taken their own life with some sort of a failing on the part of ITV, uh, with some sort of systemic problem that they weren't given enough, enough support or whatever it might be. And I've said this before, but I'll say it again. ITV2 give more than enough psychological support to everybody that goes on there. You're given a full psychometric evaluation before you enter. There's a psychologist on site at all times who you have access to, and there is a full post-show aftercare thing. Perhaps they're not super forthcoming with it, but they have a show to run you know, it's not their job to check in on you every week and say, Hey, how's it going? Also, as the show continues and goes on and on, this is mean, this is not me saying I don't have sympathy for those. Sophie was one of my best mates, like, but she wouldn't want me to pity that or say that it was somehow the fault of ITV too, right? I, I know that she wouldn't. 
Um, if people want to blame it on that, right? And I did this tweet. It was when Caroline Flack passed away. I did this tweet and um, it went pretty big. And I said, uh, how many people need to die from reality TV before we realize that it's not the fault of the producers or the newspapers they are not the ones who are retweeting and posting vitriol on a daily basis. If you want to find out who is the cause of this problem, look in the mirror. And the problem is people, the general public believe that somebody with a blue tick now no longer has feelings or emotions. They're just like this kind of sounding board to throw things at. So that's kind of my, my thoughts in terms of like the big stuff that's gone on recently. Um, more so in terms of the values and things, man. Like my main problem with reality TV at the moment is it takes these people out of the general public and then puts them on a pedestal. And what does that say to everybody that's listening? It says that you too, your path toward becoming two million follower blue tick person with a, a huge clothing deal with this particular company, all that you need to do is get on reality TV. Like that's now the path to itself. So a lot of people I think that go on reality TV aren't looking for a springboard for their career they are looking for it to be their career. And that for me is is um is a challenge. I, I don't think necessarily that kids who are growing up at 14 years old should be looking to Love Island as the pinnacle, like the zenith of what their career aspirations should be. And yet I know that that's the case. I was away in Dubai with my dad a couple of years ago and we were sat down with um, a young family we got put in. It's when you go on one of those tours together and you get put in a car and it's like mum and dad and a young kid and 18 year old daughter. And, uh, dad, we're talking about just, so oh, what do you do? And what do you do? And what do you do? And this, that, and the other. And I was like, oh, I run club nights and I do this. Just get a brief, brief overview of stuff. And there was a bunch of stuff in there that I thought was super interesting and virtuous, but not really, none of them batted an eye. None of them batted an eye at playing cricket for Durham back in the day, even though one of the kids played cricket for Durham. None of them batted an eye at the podcast or at the other bits and pieces. Halfway through the night, my dad dropped. Oh, and Chris was on Love Island. That was it. Rest of the night. That's all they wanted to talk about. And I thought, that is a misalignment of values as far as I'm concerned. That is being something which literally is essentially by chance being put on a pedestal significantly higher than things which uh, require genuine uh, work ethic uh, and sort of virtue and value to get to. Um, so that's my thing to do with Love Island. And I've also got something that um, uh, relates back to what you were saying before to do with how people like to try and um, they want to make sense, right? They want to have a story to tell themselves and why they have comfort in a story. And this is the third time I'm going to drop this same psychological effect on the podcast. So the listeners should know by now, but they might not. Uh, it's something called compensatory control. Have you heard of this? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, cool. So Matthew Syed in The Times talked about this. Uh, and what he said was that, when there is a period of uncertainty, people much prefer to give something a story than to believe that it could happen by chance. So one of the uh, experiments that was done was people that were given an uncertain medical diagnosis were much more likely to see patterns in a meaningless screen of static than those that weren't. And it's used, it was used by Matthew Syed to explain why there's a proliferation of 5G conspiracy theories and stuff mm. like that at the moment, because it is significantly easier to believe that this global pandemic was caused by the plans of some malign scientists than by the chance mutation of a silly little microbe. And um, as soon as I saw that, it has got so, that compensatory control has so many wide ranging implications. I think that's really interesting. I want to go back to the Love Island thing in a second if we can, but sure. that's so interesting because I think what, there's Michael Marmot, who's a professor, a brilliant Australian professor who's studied lots of aspects of health and depression, said to me, at the heart of so much depression is a lack of control. And I think it's interesting. Um, we live in a society and culture where people have very limited control over their lives, right? Um, and people have been actually systematically denied it. So I'll give a, 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 an obvious example, which is Michael Marmot did, is an Australian, like I say, an Australian scientist who made a real breakthrough in the 1970s. So I had noticed that loads of the people I know who are depressed and anxious, their depression and anxiety focuses around their work, right? Uh, I was like, well, am I 
um, maybe people I know are unusual. So I looked at the science on this and the polling actually is really striking. So 13% of people like their work most of the time. 63% of what the, they called sleep working. You don't like it, you don't hate it, you sort of get through it. And uh, I think it was 23% fucking hate their jobs, right? It's quite striking, right? That means you're almost twice as likely to hate your job as to love your job. And the vast majority of people are not enjoying the thing they're doing most of the time. So I started to think, well, could this bear some relationship to our depression and anxiety crisis? And that's when I learned about and went to interview Professor Marmot. So he had basically discovered in the 1970s the single biggest factor that causes depression at work. Not the only one, but the biggest factor by a long way is if you go to work tomorrow morning, and you have low or no control over your work, right? Mm -hmm. So if you go in and you're like a robot on a uh, on an assembly line, right? So you, you can't use your creativity, you can't use your intelligence, you can't, you, you just got to do what you're told and you're told by your boss and that's why you have to do it. Um, and, and it's really interesting, I think, so, and workplaces are now very controlled, you know, people are living under the tyranny of email. Um, and, and I think, um, I think it's one reason, actually, this lack of control is one reason why slogans like take back control, the Brexit um, slogan, which uh, uh, resonates so deeply. Mm. People at a very deep level feel they don't have control over their lives. Now, I leaving the European Union hasn't given anyone back any control over anything. I'm, as you probably guessed, my, my, my views about that. But whatever you think about that, I think it does help us to understand why these things resonate. And it's really interesting because there is a solution to that, right? A very simple solution and it's a big change but it's in some ways simple uh, to understand it i went to interview um a group of people in baltimore uh one of them was called meredith keo and meredith was when i met her she was in her uh early late 20s early 30s and meredith used to go to bed every sunday night just sick with anxiety right she had a kind of administrative job it wasn't the worst job in the world right she, she would tell you she wasn't being bullied or anything but she just, it was really boring and she couldn't bear the thought this was going to be the next 30 years of her life, and more than that, 50 years, whatever. Um, so one day with her, uh, her husband, Josh, and her friends, they did this really quite bold thing. Josh had worked in bike stores in Baltimore since he was like 15. And especially in the US, you know, low uh, income jobs, you don't have health care, you don't even have guaranteed holiday time. You know, it's just really insecure. Ruthless, yeah, yeah brutal you can be fired at any moment you've got no rights at work and um one day josh and his the colleagues he worked with in this bike store said to themselves what does our boss actually do right they their boss wasn't a arsehole or anything but they were like we seem to do all the work and he seems to make all the money right so they decided they were going to uh, do something bold uh, they set up a bike store of their own, but this bike store worked on a different principle. So the place they'd worked before was like where most people watching this will work, a corporation, right? You've got a boss at the top and everyone has to pretty much do what he says or you leave. You know, you can rebel a little bit, but it's pretty limited. Um, that's actually a very recent human invention and it goes back a little bit more than 100 years. They decided they were going to build their bike shop around an older idea. So their bike shop is what's called a democratic cooperative. So they don't have a boss. Uh, they make decisions about the business together, have a meeting once every couple of weeks to vote. If they don't agree, in practice, they agree most of the time. They share all the proceeds, the money, according to how much they work. Some do a little bit more work than others. Um, they um, they share out the good tasks and the shitty tasks so no one gets stuck with the sh all the shit tasks. And one thing that was so interesting, and this totally fits with Professor Marmot's research, spending time with them, was how many of them talked about how they had been depressed and anxious in their previous job and we're not depressed and anxious now. And it's not like they, you know, they they quit their jobs fixing bikes and went off to become Beyonce's backing singers, right? Mm. They fix bikes before they fix bikes now. What was the difference? Now they had control over their work. Now that's still a capitalist economy. They compete in a capitalist economy. They had to have a good shop or it will shut down, mm. right? But the the the, u, the unit that's competing is a democratic cooperative. Where, and I just think about when I was spending time there and other democratic cooperatives, and there's loads of them. I was thinking about how many people do I know who are depressed and anxious who would feel quite differently if they knew that tomorrow they were going to work in a workplace where the boss was accountable to them as well as the other way around, mm. where they can control it, where if they can use their intelligence for their task, if something isn't working, they can persuade their colleagues, they can change how it works. It's actually more efficient as well. A study at Cornell University found that more democratic businesses do much better. 
because you're using the intelligence of all your workers, not just, you know, you're not deadening them all day. Mm. So there's a lot of ways we can change the way we live. Partly that's individuals can do that. And partly I, I just I just think we should get rid of corporations. I think everything should be a democratic. All businesses should be democratic cooperatives. They're more, it's more efficient. It's better for the economy. And it's much better for people's mental health. But um, th- I think it helps us to see again, when you reframe problems in this way, based on the best science, again, you can see how that's saying to people who are depressed and anxious. It's not that there's something wrong with you, right? It's not that you're broken. It's that we we fell into these ways of living that didn't work very well for us, that don't meet our needs. And we can change those things together, right? We don't have to go on in these ways. It's about giving people, like you were saying before, Chris, giving people a sense of power and agency that we can change change these things Mm -hmm. and some of these are small changes some of them are big changes but the changes that are possible are incredible and one of the reasons i think i'm actually very optimistic about change is partly because i'm gay right and i'm 41 years old and i've seen the world if you had i didn't hear the phrase gay marriage till i was 21 years old right and and when I heard it, I thought, well, that's fucking never going to happen, right? <laughs> the, the, the sca- and I, 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 in the book, I tell a story of um, a really close friend of mine who um, I think about all the time when I get into a mode where I think, oh, we can't change anything. And I've been thinking about him a lot in the last few weeks for reasons that will be obvious when I say it. So in 1994, my friend Andrew Sullivan was diagnosed as HIV positive at the height of the AIDS crisis, the last big plague, if you like. Uh, it's not totally the same, a lot of differences, obviously, but some parallels. Mm. And this was before there were protease inhibitors or anything. So this was a death sentence, right? His best friend, Patrick, had already died of AIDS. G- gay people, intravenous drug users, all sorts of people were just dying all over the place. And Andrew decided he would do one last thing before he died. He went to a little place called Provincetown and he wrote a book about a crazy utopian idea that no one had ever written a book advocating, right? And he thought, well, I'm never going to live to see this, obviously. No one alive today will live to see it. But maybe someone further down the line will pick up this idea. The idea he wrote, the first book ever to advocate was gay marriage, right? And when I tried to get, when I think, oh, fuck, things are never going to change. I tried to imagine going back in time to 1994 and saying to Andrew, okay, Andrew, you're not going to believe me. 26 years from now, you'll be alive. Step one, great news. Elton Elton John's married. (laughs) <laughs> Elton John's married. You'll be fucking married um, the, to a man because that would be legal. Uh, I'll be with you when the Supreme Court of the United States quotes this book you're writing now, when it makes it mandatory for the entire United States to introduce gay marriage. And I'll be with you when you get an invitation uh, from the president of the United States to go and have dinner with him the next night in a White House that will be lit up in the colours of the rainbow flag <laughs> to celebrate what you and everyone else have achieved. And by the way, that president is going to be black, right? Yeah. Every aspect of that would have been like, okay, Chris, yeah. uh, 25 years from now, a transgender prime minister <laughs> is going to invite us to smoke crack in Downing Street <laughs> yeah. with her. You know, I mean, it would have seemed like, not that we smoke crack. Yeah, yeah, good night. The, <laughs> so it would be fun. Uh, the, the, you know incredible changes are possible Mm -hmm. and i think you know particularly in a moment like this when we're all feeling pessimistic for totally understandable reasons we're in a terrible crisis it's so important to stress to people that incredibly powerful positive changes are possible and we are all the beneficiaries of them the idea of the weekend was a crazy radical idea when it was first proposed by ordinary working class people in the 19th century now if anyone tried to take away the weekend they'd be lynched, right? Mm -hmm. That, you know, um, my grandmothers were not allowed to have bank accounts in their own fucking names Mm -hmm. when they got married, right? That's not that long ago. There are, and of course, things can get worse as well, as some people will have noticed from the news. Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, it's really important. Depression is, um, there's a doctor called Tyrrell Harris who gave me the best definition of depression that I got for the whole book. She said, Everyone experiences hopelessness sometimes. But depression is when hopelessness spreads over your whole horizon like an oil slick. And I think one of the ways you break that, of course, it's extremely irritating to depress people to say, hey, cheer up. That's mm. not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is together, rather like uh, those Cambodian doctors with the 
guy who needed a cow. Yep. Together, we can figure out what is causing this depression and anxiety crisis and we can deal with it. Right. And the fact that depression and anxiety have gone up so much in the past five weeks should at least help us with one thing. Right. No one thinks in the last five weeks human biology suddenly mutated to make us all depressed. Right. The environment changed. Yeah, and I've got, the, I have, a, I have a, a sentence here on my notes which says, searches for the term depression are 50% higher now than they were in December. Does this prove your hypothesis that depression is highly dependent on environmental factors? Yes. Thank you. Look at <laughs> and, that. We did it. Important to say, it's important to say it's not my hypothesis. It's you, the hypothesis of the leading medical body in the world, the World Health Organization. And your who, hypothesis. By the way, we're all turning and me. <laughs> yeah, but I got it from them. So let's yeah, give them yeah, fair yeah. credit. Uh, and lots of other people as well, as well as doctors and psychiatrists and scientists. But the the um who I learned it from. Um but yeah, no, I think you're totally right that that, you know, these were always primarily there are real biological components. It's important to keep stressing that. I'm happy to talk about them if you want. Mm. But these were always primarily biological and psychological problems. Uh, and uh, sorry, I'll say again. These were always, to a large degree, social and psychological problems. Mm -hmm. And a large part of the solutions need to be built around dealing with those problems. And the last third of my book, Lost Connections, is really very practical ways. People I met all over the world, from East London to Sydney, who were uh, to Sao Paulo, who were dealing in a very practical way with these problems. I want to I want to talk about those in a second. One thing that I've been thinking a lot about recently uh, is to do with the self development uh, world, which I'm I'm head and feet into. You know, I a big advocate of morning routines. I have a very routinized day. I do my journaling. I make sure that I have a morning walk in sunlight. I do. You know, I have a, a significant number of structures that. Um, ensure that my self-care is looked after. In fact, self-care is one of the five five uh, key core habits that I have in my life. It's one of the key values that I have in my own life because if I don't do my self-care, then everything else crumbles as well. But I wonder how much of these resurgence or the surgeons in the world of self-development is due to people trying to take control, trying to bring some order to the chaos of their life. It's like a very macro version of OCD, you know, there's, there's certain things that you can control, there's certain things that you can't control. But if, and I know this for a fact, I know that if I do morning walk, journaling, meditation, reading, back rehab, cook my food, train, go to sleep on time, don't spend too much time on my phone, don't use my phone until 4 p.m., all the, all the structures, all these things. And that sounds incredibly autistic, you know, to have this like structure, structure of the day. But that brings order to chaos, right? That allows me, that wraps that around. And I think that it's twofold. Firstly, I think that we still, as a modern society, haven't got over our fear of death. And I think that we are trying to transcend our fear of death through the longevity movement, which is going on at the moment. I had Dr. David Sinclair, one of the world's leading uh, longevity yeah, doctors yeah. on, huge, huge name. And um, the comments to that video, I've never had more passionate comments to it. Why? Why? Why would people be getting so emboldened, so so uh, emotional about something which is nicotinamide, anamide, dinucleotide supplementation and resveratrol at three in the morning and stuff like that? Why are people getting so uh, emotional about intermittent fasting when I can have Douglas Murray on talking about transgender pronouns and like people just sort of nah, it's a thing and then some people get emotional about it. The reason that I think it is, is because people are desperately searching. They've lost faith in, in religion. I think that secularism is increasing and that there's the afterlife and stuff doesn't give people that sense, same sense of comfort about where their life's going to finish. So they're desperately trying to hope that they can extend it. And I think that the self-development world is perhaps a similar way a uh, similar way that people are trying to bring control into their life, trying to create these structures, the morning routine, the evening routine, the way that they think, you know, meditation practice, oh, and just let, let go, return to the breath, let go, return to whatever is present, the power of now, all of this sort of stuff. I think that there's some unifying, um, some unifying principles in that. That's really interesting. I'm just thinking about what you're saying. I think, I think there's lots of things in what you're saying. One thing, and I, I don't think it's the biggest thing, but I think one thing that relates to that, I think you have to see that in the context of this 
explosion in loneliness, right? So the, the, there's incredible studies on this, a study that asks Americans, how many close friends do you have that you could turn to in a crisis? And when they started doing it years ago, the most common answer was five. Today, the most common answer, not the average, but the most common answer is none, right? Uh, 40% of Americans agree with the statement, nobody knows me well. And on those international league tables in Britain, we're just, we're just behind them. And I think there's a thing about, in a profoundly lonely society, all an individual has is the self, right? Or at least they begin to believe all they have is the self. Mm-hmm. And what that can do is begin to promote, uh, so it can promote, uh, and I'm not saying this is, I want to be clear, the kind of things you're describing, like having mm-hmm. a routine and so on, are extremely healthy ways of structuring anyone's life, mm-hmm. whether you're you know, a lonely society or a profoundly socially connected society. So I'm not talking about that. But I think it can produce a kind of um, self-centeredness because the self is all you have. And I remember speaking, um, I spent a lot of time interviewing this incredible man named um, Professor John Cassiopo, who was the leading expert in the world on loneliness. And uh, he sadly died recently, but he, I remember him saying to me, you know, um, why do we exist? Why are we here, right? Um, One key reason is that our ancestors on the savannas of Africa were really good at one thing. They weren't bigger than the animals they took down a lot of the time. They weren't faster than the animals they took down a lot of the time, but they were much better at banding together into groups and cooperating. So just like bees evolved to live in a hive, humans evolved to live in a tribe. And we are the first humans ever to disband our tribes. And if you think about the circumstances where we evolved, if the human, if an individual was separated from the tribe, they'd be depressed and anxious for a really fucking good reason. You're about to die, right? You're in terrible danger. If you get injured, no one will be there to heal you. Uh, if you, you you can't hunt. Um, th- How, th- I want to interject there, Johan, because I've, sure, sure. I've heard you tell this story a number of times yeah. and I've always wanted to jump out into sure, the sure, conversation and, and do exactly what I'm going to do right now. Um, how is depression adaptive or fitness enhancing? So, um, it's a slightly technical way of putting it, but Professor Cassiopo said to me, depression and anxiety are necessary aversive signals to get back to the tribe, right? Okay. So if you so think I, about- I, I get that. I get that you have this yearning, oh, no. you have this, yeah, you have this yearning to be around other people. Um, which is what people feel as loneliness, right? It's like a hunger for, for company. You know, that's how I would describe it. What I don't understand is why does depression make you bedbound? Why does depression make you not want to get up and do things and move? That's what I don't understand. So I think there's a few possible explanations for that. There's a guy I interviewed called Professor Robert Sapolsky, who's at Stanford University, and a guy called uh, Paul Gilbert, who's also got interesting theories about this. So uh, Professor Sapolsky did this interesting work a long time ago with um primates with um baboons and it turns out uh, so he was living with them on the savannas of africa and baboons it turns out male baboons live in a really strict hierarchy mm-hmm. so if there's 40 of them number three knows he's above number four number seven knows he's above number eight and uh, so uh, you know there's um uh you know, very strict hierarchy and where you are in the hierarchy determines things like what you get to eat what women you get to fuck um how whether you get to sit in the shade it's a really big deal right and what he noticed professor sapolsky other people have written about this as well is um it's only the baboons and so the baboons at the very bottom of the hierarchy and it moves around you're, you're, not, you're not born into the hierarchy you can it can shift The baboons at the bottom of the hierarchy often will behave in a particular way. They will, because basically everyone can beat the shit out of them, right? Very rarely does everyone gang up and beat up number one. It happens sometimes when they drive him out. But mostly, if number four is having a bad day, he'll go and beat up the person at the bottom of the the troop. Number seven is having a bad day, he'll go and beat up the same person. So the person at the bottom, the baboon at the bottom is absorbing a load of shit all the time. And one of the things they'll do is they will cover their heads, they'll put their their butt in the air, and they'll just stop moving, and they'll stop eating, and they'll just stay there. And this is called a submission response, right? And it's basically the baboon going, all right, you cunts, you beat me, right? Just leave me alone. You've beaten me. I'm defeated. I just want to be left alone now, right? And 
Paul Gilbert and some other scientists have argued that one of the things depression is, and again, it's we're moving around because there are mm-hmm. lots of things depression is, and it's we don't want to give a simplistic story. There are many causes, but one of the things depression could be seen as is a submission response, right? It's going, I'm fucking, I've taken enough of the humiliation, I've taken enough of the stress, please leave me alone, I cannot go on anymore. And I think that's quite a plausible explanation when you speak to, if I think about people I've known who are depressed. Is there Not for everyone. Um, is there an element, do you think, perhaps, of being away from the tribe would mean caloric intake is likely to be down? That you're probably going to have less food, less resources? Is that a reason, perhaps, to be more sedate, to be more um, still so that you don't expend that? That's something I've been thinking about. That's interesting. I would want to ask people who are much more, who, who, are, who are scientists on that. But I think my instinct is because it kicks in so quickly, even really very small doses of loneliness. Yes, yes. Um, so before you would have had a deprivation of calories, make people feel absolutely terrible. Yeah, yeah. But then I, I don't, but there's an interesting fact about loneliness I've been thinking about actually. Something, something Professor Cassiopo told me that I didn't clock that much at the time and I've been thinking about a lot in relation to this period of quarantine. So remember, when Professor Cassiopo started studying loneliness, obviously to study something, you have to define what it is, right? And at first you think that would be really easy. Everyone knows what loneliness is. If you say to someone, are you lonely? No one struggles to understand the concept, right? But it turned out to be quite hard to, to define because most people instinctively think, well, loneliness is being alone, right? But it turned out people describing themselves as lonely didn't bear that much relationship to how many people they saw every day. I mean, I thought that was weird at first, but then Professor Cassiopo said, well, okay, imagine the first time you go to a new city. Let's say you've never been to New York and you go to Times Square for the first time. You're not alone, right? You're surrounded by people, but you feel lonely, right? So he's trying to figure out what is it that makes people lonely? If it's not interacting with other people, what is it? And he discovered loneliness isn't about the number of people you interact with. Loneliness is about how much meaning you share with other people. And one of the ways he helped me to understand this was to say, you know, we've all had the experience when a relationship breaks down, when the other person is still around, but you feel really lonely, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not alone. They're there, but you feel like shit and you feel lonely. Why is that? It's because the sense of meaning between you is gone, right? So loneliness is not about uh, uh, purely about how many people you interact with. Loneliness is about how many people you share something meaningful with, right? Mm. I've got a, what... I've got an interesting point there to do with solitude mm. as well, and this comes from Cal Newport's book, Deep Work. Oh, I love him, yeah. Cal's, Cal's great, although he's absolutely impossible. He's harder than you to get on a podcast, Joe, <laughs> and that, that, is a, that is a talent. Um, what he says is, he's talking about solitude, and he says that people require solitude in order to be able to have time to think, to be able to process thoughts. And he said that solitude is not time on your own. Solitude is time away from the input of other minds. Mm, and in an always-on technology, technology world where people say, well, I spent, I spent all of my trip to, uh, drove to Manchester and back. That's five hours. Yeah, mate, you had the radio on and you made five phone calls in that time. You weren't in solitude. You weren't free from the input of other minds. And I think that that's a very interesting uh, definition, a very useful definition, one that I've been thinking as well. And again, to the people that are listening, I'm going to keep drilling it into you. If you can, during your quarantine, first thing that you do upon waking, go for a morning walk. The weather in the UK at the moment is fantastic. Leave your phone in your house, get up, go for a walk. There is some really robust evidence that shows that getting sunlight exposure early in the morning is good for your circadian rhythm. It helps to get uh, activate your adrenal system. It helps to downregulate your adenosine receptors, which is what's going to make you tired later in the day, all this sort of stuff. You don't need your morning coffee. Um, and on top of that, it is a period of time where you can allow all of the thoughts that have come up during your sleep to just burble and pop and you can focus on where you're walking and you can just think the things, right? You don't need to obsess. There's nothing to do yet. I you know. should totally, you should, Chris, you should totally have on the podcast, my friend, Isabel Benke, who's an incredible Chilean primatologist and is the most glamorous person I know. Every time I email her and I'm like, Isabel, where are you? She's like, I'm in the Congolese rainforest. Oh my God. Is to- that glamorous? That's cool. I don't know whether it's she's, glamorous. She's, she's so gorgeous that even I almost. Is she single? Have- is she single? Yeah. Yeah. I will put you in touch there. She might well be. This is the only uh, reason I'm here. This is just a, glor- a glorified groundwork session. Thank you. It's like a very highbrow blind date, right? I love but it. The, 
exactly. I'll, I'll, I'll take on the silver black role in this. But but, but as because Isabel talks a lot about, uh, she did this really interesting work. She worked with um, female bonobos. Well, bonobos. She worked with bonobos uh, initially. She studied bonobos initially in Whipsnade Zoo, and uh, <laughs> she's very interesting on this because I didn't know this. One of the ways that bonobos live is they engage in massive amounts of lesbian group sex. It's a constant, Hugely ongoing sexual creatures. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she she was the first person to document that. Um, bonobos will work really hard to make dildos and she was in obviously in a, a british zoo so if you give them like a bucket they will break off the handle and just start going at it at, like it's a dildo yep. um and she thought it was hilarious because she's from chile which is a much more free and open place when it comes to sexual things and she thought it was just hilarious watching all these british people with their kids trying to explain to them oh darling <laughs> darling look away <laughs> exactly little, but, little johnny asking mummy what's that but you know, it's this really fascinating thing, which is, so she worked with bonobos in Whipsnade Zoo, and then she worked with bonobos in their natural habitat in the Congo. It was just at the end of the war in the Congo, which I'd actually covered as well. And Isabel uh, was out there, she was living with this, this bonobo troop for years, and she noticed something which hadn't been documented until her, which is in uh, captivity, bonobos will often develop symptoms that look a lot like human depression. A bit like the submission response, you know, they just sit, they rock back and forward, they won't join the group, they look like they, they, you know, they stop grooming themselves, they go to shit, right? And she noticed this never happens in the wild. And she she argues, and there's a huge amount of evidence that animals in captivity um, start behaving in ways that look like obsessive compulsive disorder or, or mental illness, right? Parrots will rip out their feathers, elephants will grind their tusks down you know, which are a source of great pride in the wild down to like bloody stumps um horses will start obsessively swaying there's all sorts of things and isabel argues a big part of this is just physical movement right we've become a society that does not move mm. um if you think about the the actual n- amount of movement we do we are the humans who move least who have ever lived right and uh, and she argues uh i think the way she put it to me it's in the book is sort of an animal that is not moving through its natural habitat cannot be a healthy animal physically or mentally. I think that's totally right. But I just want to go back to something you were saying before, because I forgot to pick up on this. I think it's one thing about Love Island. I'm really interested in. I actually love reality TV, but I was away from Britain when Love Island came out. So good, I, good for you. I, it's fine. If you did me, uh, if you gave me a, uh, uh, if you did gave me a, um, what do you call it? Uh, trivial pursuit qu- series of you questions should, yeah. about it's fine. about big brother in the in the early 2000s i could do a lot there but um but what i'm interested in about love island is love island the, the people who from love island who've contacted me and people from other reality shows led me to think there's this thing about i think it reveals something about the game i mean the game of our society and culture not narrowly the game of love island that the people who are winning the game feel like shit right? That tells you something about the game. It's a bit like when you meet billionaires, right? I've now in my life met quite a lot of billionaires and I've almost never met a billionaire who wasn't unbelievably unhappy, right? Like achingly unhappy. And um, I've met two that I would say were not unhappy and all the rest were, right? And I think there's something about, because it's, um, because it's a game that's a quest to be valued uh, for things that are, uh, I would be careful because I don't want to disrespect. Throw it um, out there, so- Johan. No one, no one on Love Island has has uh, so few followers that they can't take on the chin what you're going to say. So just say it. I would say because it's actually not really a comment on Love Island because mm-hmm. that's a cassette much about it. But I was, it's a great thing to look amazing, right? And to, and that's an effort to look amazing, right? Obviously, some people start off with slightly better genetic inheritances than others, but mm-hmm. it's an effort, and that is an achievement. And I don't, I'm not dissing that. For a minute, I, something I appreciate and enjoy in other people, certainly not in myself. But the, but, but I think because you're being honoured, that I would accept that I would exempt that bit because that's an effort and an achievement. But because you're being honoured for things that are like following, you know, how would I put it? I I already I, know I already know what I, I know what it is, right? Say, so, 
yeah, I know, I know, I know precisely what it is. I think I've got a, a couple of different bits here. So, um, first and foremost, it's the dichotomy difference. I do a lot of fitness. I talk a lot about fitness on this channel. It's a dichotomy difference between training for aesthetics or training for performance. Training for, oh. training for aesthetics is purely subjective. There is no objective measure. There's some objective measures. What is your actual objective body fat percentage? What is your ap- actual objective lean muscle mass percentage? Stuff like that. But very much so when you're talking about aesthetics or a physique competitor, it's inherently a subjective, it's an opinion. You go up on stage, you are judged by someone. You don't actually know if your physique is better than the person next to you because there are no objective measures. Let's go to the complete opposite end of the scale, which is powerlifting. Powerlifting, you pick a weight. That weight is the same for you as it is for me, as it is for the next person. You either pick it up or you don't pick it up to the movement standards that are prescribed. That is objective versus subjective, right? What that means is that one of those has a very, very easy sense of progression. You know where you are and all of the progress can be judged internally without anyone else to help you along the way. So that's the first thing. Second thing is when you get into reality TV, there is an expected modus operandi, right? There is a way that reality TV stars are supposed to do. And I take great fucking pleasure in trying to break that stereotype as hard as I can. When Piers Morgan said that Love Island stars are the most stupid people on the planet, I issued him an open letter to come onto the podcast to have a little discussion about it to see who was the stupid one. (laughs) Um, And what is happening there is like the particular Love Island star is putty and there is a shaped glove, an iron-shaped glove, and that's the life that they have to live. And you get this piece of putty, which could be a U shape, it could be a T shape, it could be an I shape, it could be a star. And every single one of them gets forced in from the back and they have to fill all of these spaces. Because you've got to do the thing. You've got to do the after sun podcast. You've got to do the photo shoot for the, for the new clothing brand. You've got to do the Insta. Hey guys, it's Chris here from Love Island talking about this. Like you have to live a pre-prescribed life, which in no way aligns with the values that you brought into it Hmm. so you're not being seen and this is what this is one of the big realizations that i had after coming off and it was that i wasn't indulging myself intellectually i'm painfully curious like like agonizingly curious about everything about absolutely everything and i wasn't allowing myself to indulge in that the other thing to consider as well is that that uniqueness in everyone, in the Love Island contestants that may or may not be listening, or anybody, anybody that's listening, that uniqueness, your life experiences, your genetics, the scars that you have, the victories that you have, the failures that you have, all of those are your unique offering to the world. It is your competitive advantage. It is what you can offer everybody else. And that's why I think learning to be able to tell the truth, learning what you think, how you feel, what you enjoy, doing self-inquiry, doing introspective work, removing your biases. That's why I think that's so important because the closer that you can get to your truth, the closer you can offer to the world what only you can offer. There is no other Johan Hari. There is nobody else who has had all of the life experiences with the Scottish mother and the this and the this. There is no one else on the planet who has that. And what that means is that no one else can do the work that you can. Now, someone could have tried to create a, a proxy of it, an analogy, an, an analogous piece of work, or you know, something close. But no one quite could have framed it the way that you did when you wrote Lost Connections. I'm just about it. I love that way you put it, that you're not being seen. I think that's so interesting. And Is it fair to say um, it's not just that you're I had this um, for a couple of series of Big Brother. I used to do their show Big Brother on the Couch, and I got to know some of the contestants after they got out. And, I, and it was really interesting seeing them when they came out. And think about that you're not being seen. With them, sometimes I felt like it was a sense. Of, I, I wonder if you feel this, or if, tell me if this is just completely off being. It's not just that you're not being seen. At some level, you're being valued for something that you're not, or something that you can't sustain. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Well, so this is a. a, a brilliant a brilliant exercise i'm going to do it on you now i don't know whether you've heard uh brett weinstein and heather haying on joe rogan have you heard this one i think so good right i want you to picture a man who is beautiful but not hot okay now i want you to picture a man who is hot 
but not beautiful. Okay. Right, cool. The difference between those two individuals, and you can do it for the people that are listening, can do it for whatever their uh, gender, sexual preference of choice, or both, um, <laughs> is um, the difference between those two that you've come up with there, the difference between hotness, yeah, and beauty, is that hotness wanes with age. Beauty is mm. timeless. So mm. you can imagine someone, like the, the perfect example, which sounds so fucking perverse, is uh, Dame Judi Dench. You oh, know? Right. Beautiful. Have you got Have you got a crush on going to Dame Judi Dench? You? Look, she's beautiful, not hot, right? So right, I'd, right. I'd, I'd marry her, but I probably wouldn't fuck her. Like, okay. you know, that's kind of the way it would work. But... So, so Judy, if you're watching, Judy, look, I, I apologize. Please come on the podcast. I'd love to talk to you about how what it's like to be beautiful. I think, I think if you married her, you would give in. You'd fuck her eventually. You She'd have to wear you down, right? Oh, but she, you get there. You get there. This is a subject area we never thought that we'd get to it, on modern wisdom. It, it would be like a horrific remake of. Do you remember? Um, uh, you must remember this. That as time goes by, that sitcom from the oh, Jesus. the nineties. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah. like a dark pornographic very version very of that. pornographic version yeah. of that so um yeah you've, you've got this difference between the two right and the problem is and either way you're just changing the subject for fucking I'm judy getting dench. back i'm getting back to beauty and hotness okay. johan yeah, yeah. judy yeah. dench is too much in my head now <laughs> um beauty scales beauty compounds right with time hotness doesn't compound hotness wanes even men i've by all of the red pill logic on the planet i am at my smv peak my sexual market value peak right now this year this is (laughs) by definition the you know these fucking quasi scientific stuff that they come up with um but everybody is you should say that because i got a call from a friend who's exactly the same age as me i'm 41 and he was crying and i said josh what's wrong and he said um I was just looking at a porn site and there was a category that said older men brackets 35 plus. And he's like, we're now literally <laughs> the fucking, the fucking older men with category. 90 year olds. What the fuck has happened? Oh no. Like, there is oh. a, there's a, there's a point at which you become chronically aware of your own mortality. And it is, it's also, there's a, there's a time when people start saying to you in the street, um, to their little kids, look out for that man, as opposed to look out for that boy. And I was like, fuck, I hate that. But yeah, so, um, Beauty, right? It's grace. It's wisdom. It's timeless stuff. It's the, it's the things that aren't in your face. So hotness, that's what, um, FHM, I don't even know if these still exist, FHM and Fast Car Magazine and stuff like that. Loads of references from the nineties. Um, that's what the girls on the front of that. My uh, friend. I love the, the idea that to younger viewers, we'd have to explain not what FHM was, but what a magazine was. Yeah, anyway, probably. Yeah. It's kind of like, it's like an ebook. It's like Instagram, <laughs> but on paper. Um, <laughs> um, so. Uh, Yeah, and what I think a lot of the time people do is they signal for hotness, not only with other partners, but also in themselves. So they try and develop hotness, not beauty. And I will happily say that I have some girl friends who are getting more and more beautiful as time goes on, regardless of their age. Like they're becoming more and more wise. They're becoming, they've got more poise. They've got more grace, the way they hold themselves. They're, the way that they're able to be commanding, but also soft and compassionate. You know, all of those different things, they're the untangibles. But the hotness, that's what a lot of people signal for in a partner. And like, let me tell you, if you are signaling for hotness, you are buying into a depreciating asset. You are getting an asset which, by definition, is only heading in one direction. You're putting a trade on where you're going to exit the position at a lower uh, lower than where you where you entered it. Yeah, it's so interesting, Chris, because it goes back to it made me think about something related to what we were saying before about junk values, right? Because th- there's this moment. Uh, so there's this big debate about why do junk values make people more depressed, right? Why does thinking life is about money and status and how you look make you more depressed, right? And one of the arguments is that it, uh, if you value people for their external appearance, it actually fucks up the quality of your relationships. And there's a moment that really helped me to understand this. So in 2009, Melania Trump went to speak at NYU. Fairly at the hot. University. Melania Trump, fairly hot. I'd put her in, in, in hot, slightly beautiful category. Interesting. Mm-hmm. The, well, that very much relates to what I'm about to say, which is that so she went to speak at New York University. I don't know why, well, there must be some reason. And one of the students asked her, um, would you have married Donald Trump if he wasn't rich? And she said, do you think he would have married me if I wasn't beautiful? 
And that tells you something. It's a funny line and credit to Melania Trump, who I feel very sorry for, actually. But Hmm. think about what that reveals about the nature of their relationship, right? So that is a a very strong expression of these external kind of junk values. Very transactional, right? right? Yeah. So Melania Trump knows if she ceases to be hot, let's say Melania Trump just fucking pigs out one day, right? And just wants to eat a KFC or... And Donald Trump, she knows she's finished. She's out, right? In fact, uh, there's an interview Donald Trump did with Howard Stern where he was asked... If uh, Melania was badly burned in a fire, would you still love her? And Trump said, do her tits get burned, right? (laughs) So now compare that. That So she she knows, the charming, lovely man. So she knows if she ever loses her looks, she's finished, right? And he does have that narrow conception of hotness, not beauty, I think. Mm. Um, And I mean, this is a, and, 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 and he knows if he ever lost his money, she's out the door as well, right? Compare that to whatever you think about the political differences between them, Barack and Michelle Obama, where I'm sure Barack, I mean, Michelle Obama happens to be this stunningly beautiful woman, but I'm sure they would say, you know, well, they would love each other even if they became homeless and they got fat or whatever, right? So you can see how being driven by a, an extreme focus on external, of course, we all like, pe- you know, we all like people to look good. But if you you can see how that extreme focus on it creates a form of anxiety and depression, right? In a way that um, being valued for more more enduring qualities uh, doesn't cause so much anxiety. And I, I wonder that sometimes about because I see that with some of my friends. I think about uh, some of my friends who were you know really like beautiful twenty year olds and still look great. And you think. If so much of your self-esteem is pegged to your to your a particular kind of looks, you can have that crazy anxiety about aging in a way that if your self-esteem is about uh, some other things, it doesn't. Which is not to say, look, I'm in favour of people, I'm in favour of really good-looking people, and I'm in favour of people working hard to look good. But I think there must be something about. Um, to me, it feels like Love Island, from the little I know of it, and other reality shows which I know about much more are an example of a wider social trend, which is that it's training people to think happiness lies in places where you actually will not find happiness. In fact, you will find anxiety in those places, right? A a life where you are uh, constantly being judged by external uh, simplifying factors um, isn't going to be a life where you feel good, even if you win, even if you get to be... The problem is that you don't ever get to actually find out who you are. You don't ever actually get to fulfill what your your genuine interests in life are. And I've been asking people this a lot recently. I've been saying uh, people are talking about a, a lack of purpose and meaning while they're at home uh, because evidently a lot of people used to derive their sense of meaning from their job. They used to derive their sense of structure and routine and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, tell me by your own definition... What would have had to have happened by the end of lockdown for you to look back on lockdown and say that it was a success? That's interesting. Tell me what, tell me. And if you're listening, think to yourself, what would have had to have happened by the end of this? For, by your own definition, you have everything except for travel and uh, unlimited money. You have everything all the time in the world to do it. What would it be? And so few people can answer it. People are like, well, I don't know. I'm like, you will miss every target that you don't aim at by definition Mm. by definition you can't and that's one of the things so few people know what they want and then what happens you take someone who so amber gill girl that won love island year before last year a good friend known her for seven eight years her sister trains at my gym and blah blah you take someone like amber who is super bubbly girl who i think fits the the um what they need from a contestant really well very robust mentally got a great support structure around her just she perfect dream islander right but then you say right okay you're now going to do all of this stuff and this is the things that you're going to do and if that doesn't align with your values then you have two choices you can either continue to force feed yourself this work and stay famous but potentially feel misaligned or you can stop doing the stuff which is keeping you relevant pursue your own things but have to face the pain of now being a nobody because you don't want to do tv interviews you don't want to do the photo shoots you don't want to be judged for your looks and blah 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 and it's that again it's that forcing putty into a pre-made mold right doesn't matter what shape you are because you got to play this game there's a very very particular type of person who can break the mold and still win the game 
And um, that's why I, sometimes I get accused of thirst trapping on my Instagram. So I'll use what few residual looks in my sexual market value, whatever it is, repository that I've got left um, to try and draw people in to then link them to a podcast. So I'll be talking about like really hot in the garden today. I had a podcast with a meteorologist who was talking about how the world's getting hotter or something like that, you know, and it's like um, trying to break that. You still got to play the game a little bit is what I'm saying. It takes a very, very particular, and even me, I can't do it. I can't not play the game, at least in part, the Twitter game, the Instagram game, the Facebook game, the whatever it might be game. Um, and I think that's, it's not about, um, it's not, I think it's important to explain to people, you know, it's not that those things are inherently bad in themselves. It's about, are they part of a broad menu of things that you have in your life, right? I remember I went to, for, for Lost Connections, I went to, the first ever internet rehab center in the mm, world. Yeah. Such an interesting place. It's, um, it's in Spokane in Washington, just outside of Spokane in Washington state. And it was really interesting because, and I think it helps, it helps locate some of what you're saying as well, because you think about, I know plenty of people have healthy relationships with social media. And I know some people who have, uh, horrendous relationships with social media. And, um, I really helped to clarify it to me when I went to this place because, I remember speaking to, there were, they get all kinds of people there, but they disproportionately get young men and they disproportionately get young men who become obsessed with uh, multiplayer online role play games. Like um, it would have, it would be Fortnite now, I guess, but it didn't exist when I went. So it was things like World of Warcraft. And um, I remember speaking to loads of these young men and then talking to Dr. Hilary Cash, who runs the clinic and her saying to me, you know, you've got to ask yourself, what are these young men getting out of these games, right? I, sh- I don't mean healthy people who just do it for, you know, uh, every now and then. Mm. I mean, people who become obsessed. And she said to me, part of it is, a lot of it is these, these young men are getting things out of the game that they used to get from the culture, but they no longer get, right? They get a sense they're part of a group, a sense they're part of, you know, a sense part of the bigger, something bigger than themselves, a sense they're physically roaming around. A lot of American and British children almost never leave their house. The figures on this are incredible. Um, they get a sense that people see them and value them. They get a sense they're good at something. A lot of boys in our school system don't get a sense they're good at anything, right? Um, but what they're getting is like a, a simulation of those things. And as she was saying that to me, I started to think in a way, sometimes I think the way a lot of us use social media it's a bit like the relationship between porn and sex, right? I'm not anti-porn at all, but if your whole sex life consisted of wanking over porn, you'd be going around pissed off and irritable the whole time. I think that's. So we, I think that is the sex life of almost everybody that's listening right now with the coronavirus. <laughs> that's all you got. Well, that's, oh, that's, you, let me uh, interject. Sex toy sales in Italy went up by seventy percent. Wow. There you wow. go. That's a stat for Packings you. Packings already had a lot of sex toys in my experience. I bet so, they did. I bet uh, they did. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's impressive. The, uh, that's a stockpile. But you see the point I'm making, right? It's like um, we have needs. Um, and, and interestingly, what, what happens, if you think about the moment when the internet arrives, right, kind of for most of us around the year 2000, the internet arrives and it looks a lot like the things that had already been disappearing, right? So f- number of friends people had have been declining before Facebook. Then Facebook appears and it's like, oh, here's Facebook friends. People have been losing status in the economy prior to the arrival of of Facebook. Then it's like, oh, here are status updates to compensate for your lost status. But it's not the thing we've lost, right? In the same way that a sex-starved person given porn will get a certain amount of relief, but they don't feel the pleasure they'd feel after they've actually had sex, right? And I think I think actually we're really feeling this, even for something as simple as Zoom, right? I'm sure you've spent lots of time on Zoom in the last few weeks, like, everyone else in the history, everyone else in the world. And, um, and it's really striking, right? Being on Zoom, it, we're all in isolation. Being on Zoom is better than nothing. But being on Zoom is, doesn't feel, you don't, I don't feel you get even 50% of what you get if you're sitting with your mates, right? Because we didn't evolve to, to interact through screens. We evolved to interact face to face. Those are the creatures we are. We have certain basic needs that we can, um, that we can't, um, you know, just deny or supersede in, in simplistic it's a, it's way. It's a, mis- a misalignment, right, between us and who we are and what our desires are and the environment. And unfortunately, the environment's going to continue changing super, super quick. I said to a, a guy called Rob Henderson talking about evolution in the dating market, and I was talking about the fact that evolution at the moment is fucking pointless because by the time 
that whatever genetic mutation you have gets passed on to your children, the environment within which it might have become competitively advantageous to have to adapt to has changed. So it's like, I got his fucking point. Evolution only works with a stable environment which moves as slowly as evolution does. When you have an environment that moves more quickly, it's absolutely pointless. Right, so I, Johan, I've got a list of a couple of things I've always wanted to ask you. Oh, sure. I'm I'm going to ask you them. How would you describe what depression feels like? I would use that definition we talked about before from Tyrrell Harris. We all know what hopelessness feels like sometimes. Depression is like a kind of hopelessness spreading across your whole horizon. Another example I would give is something that I think a lot of people would identify with is um, there's this really interesting debate that happened in the 1970s. So in the 1970s, the American Psychiatric Association decided they were going to give a technical definition of depression because up till then doctors have been using whatever definition they wanted to use right so we're going to define depression to standardize it across the whole country so they did a really simple definition it's dead easy a lot of people would basically guess at something like this they they dropped 10 uh, a checklist of 10 criteria things like crying a lot feeling life is hopeless that kind of thing they send them out to all the psychiatrists and they say if um any of your patients experience more than six of these symptoms for more than two weeks, diagnose them as depressed, give them what help they can, right? So they start doing that. But quite quickly, a lot of these psychiatrists come back and go, look, we've got a bit of a problem here. Um, If we use this definition, we're going to have to define every grieving person as depressed because these are the symptoms of grief, right? And the American Psychiatric Association were like, oh, shit, that's not what we meant. So they invented something that was called, later got called the grief loophole, which said, okay, if any of your patients have any of these six of, any six of these 10 symptoms for more than two weeks, define them as depressed, unless someone they love has died in the last year, in which case they're not crazy, it's fine, uh, then you shouldn't describe them as mentally ill. And so they start using that. But that begged a really obvious question, which was, well, hang on a minute. Why is losing someone you love in the last year the only circumstance in life where you're allowed to feel like shit and not be labelled as mentally ill? What if you've lost your job? What if you've been made homeless? What if you're stuck in a job you hate for the next 40 years? We can all... what, if, what if there's a global pandemic? Exactly, right? So what happened is the, over the years, the American Psychiatric Association reduced the amount of time you're allowed to grieve and not be regarded as mentally ill from a year to six months to two months. Now they've just got rid of it. So now you can be diagnosed as mentally ill almost immediately after the death of your baby. your mum dies, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so, um, I mean, it's meant to be, you're meant to monitor the person for two weeks, but in practice they just say, have you felt like this for the last two weeks? Uh, So actually, uh, incredible, Joanne Cassiatore, who's at the University of Arizona, has shown 12% of grieving parents get get diagnosed as mentally ill and drugged in the first 24 hours after their child dies, (laughs) right? And the reason I say that in relation to a question about what depression feels like is, in a way... I don't think it's coincidence that depression and grief have the same symptoms. I think what depression is, is in part a grief for your own life not turning out how it should and a grief for your own deeper needs not being met. And most people will have experienced grief in their lives and tragically a lot of people are experiencing it now. And and, and, and I think depression feels a lot like grief. Yeah, I tweeted yesterday saying true hell is when the person you are meets the person you could have been. <laughs> And um, yeah. that's life not turning out. I think for me, I like the oil slick analogy, but I've, one of my old housemates described it as drowning in thoughts. It can be. And this is interesting. It's one of the reasons why, um, this is one of the reasons why I interviewed a lot of the scientists and, and people who've taken part in the, the studies about psychedelics, and uh, which seem to be a very promising treatment for for depression and i think that's partly because some of the people scientists involved say it's also why being in the natural world can can really help because both psychedelics and uh being in the natural world when it's particularly beautiful and striking uh give you a sense of awe right you give you a sense of oh the feeling of awe is the feeling i'm small and the world is big and that's good right it's the opposite of the kind of junk values we were talking about it's a moment if depression can feel like you're rattling around in your ego and you're trapped in your own thoughts, moments of awe 
I like moments when you think, oh, actually, my little ego with its rattling thoughts ain't, ain't that important, right? Whether I, you know, whether I succeed in this thing or fail in this thing, it doesn't matter that much. The world is big. It's, we feel this when we sit in the ocean, right? That, that, you know, the ocean is big and we are small. I've got three things left that I want to ask. Okay. First thing is, how can people get out of an acute depressive stage? So someone has had, it, it, it happens, it happens to everybody, where you just wake up one day and you've just not got it in the tank, right? What are some of the, the tacit strategies? Or how do you, you know, you wake up one morning and you think, uh, the black dog's a little bit fucking close today. Have you got some structures? Have you got some routines that you rely on that help you to keep moving forward? I do, but I think, um, I think, one thing I would say about that, and obviously the book is a really a kind of big attempt to answer that in much more detail, but one thing I would say is, you know, I would say, use an analogy, right? I, I think part of the problem of what we do is we put the job of solving depression solely onto people who are already depressed and anxious. And we don't do that with a lot of other problems. So think about car accidents. Car accidents are one of the biggest cause of death, obviously, in, in the Western world. Um, and we don't put the job of solving car accidents. We don't say to someone who's just been mangled in a car wreck, okay, how are you going to solve traffic accidents, right? What we do is actually, because it's a social problem, we have a big structure to deal with it and prevent it from happening, right? So we have driving tests, we have speed limits, we have airbags, we have arrest drunk drivers, we do a huge array of things. And then if all that fails and a person is mauled in a car crash, of course, we take them to casualty and we do our best and the doctors and nurses are heroes. But most of what we do is trying to prevent that problem happening. And that's not just the individual, that's the society that tries to prevent it. In a similar way, because depression has such deep social causes, I think the most important thing we need to do is to deal downstream with way more of those social causes, right? But so I would just say that, that I would just say that as a preface, saying, of course, that doesn't mean that, of course, there are still things individuals can do. Um, I'll give you an example of one, a very simple change that I made, which in a way is almost embarrassing to talk about because it's it feels so simple, but it was so revelatory to me. I went to interview this uh, amazing academic called Brett Ford, who is a um, psychologist at Berkeley. She's actually in Toronto now, but she was in Berkeley at the time. And she did this really interesting research. It's really simple research in some ways, part, her and a big team. They wanted to figure out, let's say that you decided you were going to spend two hours a day trying to make yourself happier. Would you actually become happier, right? And they did this research in four countries, in the US, in Japan, in Russia, and in Taiwan. And what they found was, in the US, if you try to make yourself happier, you do not become happier, or, or in the main. But in the other countries, if you try to make yourself happier, you do become happier. And they were like, how could that be? So they did more research. What they discovered was, in the US, if you try to make yourself happier, in the main, you do something for yourself. You work harder to get a promotion, you buy something for yourself, you show off on Instagram, whatever it is. So we have an instinctively individualistic idea of what it means to be happy, right? In the other countries, in the main, there are exceptions on both sides, of course, but in the other countries, if you wanted to make yourself happier, you did something for someone else, right? You did something for your friends, your family, your community, even people you didn't even know, right? So they had an instinctively collective idea of what it means to be happy. And it turns out an individualistic idea of happiness just doesn't work very well, right? Like we say, that a lot of the reality stars and wrestlers and, and porn stars who message me who've built their lives around this individualistic idea of success feel like absolute shit, right? I have never seen a more unhappy person than Donald Trump, who has won the individualistic game as much as you possibly can. He's the president of the United States. He has an actual golden tower to live in. He has a hot wife. He's he's won the game. And yet he, you can see he feels like shit, right? Um, so the way I took this on board was it used to be a lot of the time when I felt like shit, I would do something for myself, right? And for me, it was, I was never a particularly materialistic person, but some external professional achievement, right? Now, a lot of the time, I can't say I do this all the time because I don't, but a lot of the time, when I feel bad, I try to do something for someone else. And I'm, you know, I'm not Oprah. I can't turn up and give them a car, but I can leave my phone at home and go and fucking sit with them and listen to them. Uh, and in a society where people are not heard, 
just the gift of giving someone your attention and your time is so profound for their for their happiness so it really stands uh, out as well yeah i think yeah. that's 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 a nice way to do it i i certainly think that um connecting with others is a big one the challenge is that when you are in the midst of a depressive episode that's the last thing that you want to do right like you know it's a it takes a superhuman amount of effort to get out of bed and that i think is where uh, the next action a next physical action which is a concept from uh, david allen's getting things done which is a productivity uh, tool actually worked really well for me but you know chris i think that even even when you are really depressed you can text someone and remind them of a kind thing they did once you can text someone and tell them about a good thing they did right there are very small steps mm -hmm. that you can take that uh, people are very rarely so immobilized that they can't make another person feel good in some tiny way and maybe it's tiny but you know tiny gestures make actually make a I big difference couldn't agree yeah. more. one of the yeah. things i made a, a big change to do last year and i've continued to embed it is to just text people when i'm thinking about them do you think yeah. about people all the time remember i went on a road trip with one of my buddies last year across america and i think about that or i think about that training session i had five years ago where such and such slipped over or whatever it might be oh, i'm missing my mate and um, the friction now does not exist between me having that thought and me telling the friend that I'm thinking of them. That's so great. I love that. All the time. And I implore everybody that's listening, it will make your life and the life of your friendship so much better. And this is coming from like Mr. Fucking Solitude Only Child bullshit over here, right? So if I can do it, you can do it as well. But yeah, you know, you're thinking of a friend. Hey, man, thinking of you. Hope you're good. Like it it, it just is. It is what it is. Um, totally agree with you. Next thing is, is the black dog going to follow us for the rest of our lives? If you've got it, is it going to be there? Or is there a way that you can conquer it? Is there, a, you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Uh, absolutely. I think one of the worst things we do is we tell depressed people, uh, very often people are told, you know, oh, you've just got some biologically broken thing and this is going to be your life. Now, there are some, stress again, there are some real biological components to this, contributions. But actually, um, there's very strong evidence that if we make the necessary, I'll just give a very simple example. Uh, one of the heroes in my book is a doctor called Sam Everington. You know, he's a doctor in East London where I used to live. He was very uncomfortable with the fact that all his patients were being given was drugs. And he, he's not against the drugs like me. He's not opposed to them, but he could just see that a lot of his patients remained depressed. He set up a program really simple, just a gardening program where they met and they built a beautiful garden. Um, so there's a study of a very similar program in Norway that found it was more than twice as effective as chemical antidepressants in reducing depression and anxiety, partly because they reconnected with the natural world, partly because they formed a tribe, they formed a group, right? Um, so no, absolutely nobody is condemned to be depressed for their whole life. Uh, there will be some people who need a lot of love and help and support to deal with those underlying causes in their life. But if they get enough love and help and support, they can. And that job is not just on them. That job is on all of us, right? I mean, the most important message I would want to give to depressed and anxious people is help is on the way, right? Because the things that are making some people depressed and anxious are making most people's lives less than they could be, right? So it's not like there's this this group of broken people over here, this lump of broken people over here, and then there's the rest of us who need to pitiably take charity on them. If we deal with the things that are making them depressed and anxious, we'll actually lib um, enhance the lives of pretty much all of us. That, I think, is one of the key challenges that depressed people face, which is that the way that depression manifests, it's so existential and symbolic and bigger than you, and it feels like a personal curse created just for you right this is my problem incredibly you know you've and that's partly the nature of depression but that's also partly because of the way we've encouraged people to think about the problem right if you of course if you grow up in a culture where you're told you know i mean so many of the ways we talk about mental health are so flawed i know uh, several people who were terribly sexually abused who have a lot of distress about that they act out over it. They go to their psychiatrist or doctor and they're told they've got a personality disorder. That's a wicked thing to tell people, right? That's a that's a truly terrible thing to tell someone. Your personality is disordered when in fact 
you're just acting how any of us would if we've been fucking horrendously sexually abused, right? So we've got to stop acting like these are primarily internal disorders within people. They're actually, as Viktor Frankl, Holocaust survivor, said, you know, these are very often normal reactions to abnormal situations. And there are some ways in which we're all living in abnormal situations, not just in this period of coronavirus, but mm. actually in the last you know, few years. So no, I think you've got that question is really important. No one is inherently broken and nobody is incapable of overcoming these problems. It may that certainly the case that some people will need a lot of help to overcome these problems and we need a lot of individual change and social change, but those things are possible, right? Think about gay people in the 1940s were described as inherently dishonest, uh, inherently miserable, um, had tragic lives. Even gay people said that about themselves because that was the reality. You had to lie, otherwise you'd go to prison. Of course you were miserable. You're like, you constantly having to hide the your life. The fear of your... chemical castration. Exactly. Yeah. And then what happened? We had a liberation movement for gay people and an equality movement. And now, no, you'd be regarded as a pretty out there bigot if you said gay people were inherently miserable and inherently dishonest now, right? Even quite homophobic people wouldn't say that about all of us, right? Yeah. So actually, you can see how things that seem fixed and permanent qualities of people change when the social circumstances change. What we've got to do is change the social circumstances. And that's the work of all of us. I get it. Whether we're depressed or not. What I think is interesting, having had this discussion with you today, uh, and obviously having been discussing with getting you on for the last two years, so thinking about what, <laughs> how this how this was going to manifest, one of the things that struck me is um, my particular viewpoint on uh, dealing with depression, dealing with low mood, is coming at it from a very individualistic perspective. You know, a lot of the time I talk about um, the actions that you can take, um, the outcomes in your life are more under your control than you than you know. Um, so for me, I, again, had you have asked me the question, Chris, how do you get over, how do you get yourself out of an acute period of depression? My first thought wouldn't have turned to somebody else. And it definitely wouldn't have had a preface, which was to do with uh, systemic changes, society-wide changes, perhaps policy changes and, and, and stuff like that, structural changes which need to be made. Uh, mine would have been do the next action. You need to pull the pillows off you. You need to pull the, the cushions off. You need to get out. You need to have a cold shower. You need to go outside. You need to do this, this, and this. Um, I think that there's a, a lot of value of coming at it from both ways. And I genuinely think that the intersection of where we maximize what we understand now from self-development, from introspective work, from mindfulness practice, from stuff like that, um, both in a more long-term thinking way, to try and make you robust and resilient to low mood over time and to build structures in your life, which mean that if and when that low mood happens, it, you just bounce off it rather than you being fully swallowed by it. But also in an acute situation, which is where you kind of break the glass to do the this thing, which is, like I say, the cold shower, the sunlight outside, the glass of water and the phone call for a friend. That's my kind of like four step thing. Um, I, I think that the, the crossover of those two, you know, the ability for someone to have right back to the start, that agency, that control, that upward mobility that they have to be able to do the things that they can do. Because to anyone that's listening, you know, someone might have seen this, know what you do and think, I'm going to go listen to that. I'm going to see if this, th th these two British people can make me feel a little bit better about my depression. Like the outcomes in your life are far more under your control than you know. There are things that you can do today, which are going to make your tomorrow better. And there are also things that we can do as a society which will make next year and the years after that better as well. I think you're totally right. I think there's a few things I'd say about that. One is, so if you look at the scientific evidence for this, there's three kinds of cause of all, any mental health problem. Um, there's, and they play out to some degree in everyone who has a mental health problem. There's biological causes like brain changes, your genes. There's psychological causes, how you think about yourself, and there's social causes, right? And I think you're you're very much um, uh, attracted to thinking about the psychological causes, which is hugely important. Um, and I'm a strong, strong, and a big part of the book is obviously about some of the things we can do about those psychological causes. Obviously, my temperament is more to be drawn to the social causes, but they're, they're all real. I'd also say, I think you're right. I think it's important to stress to people Individual change and social change are not separate things. 
social change only happens when enough individuals demand it, right? So it's not like there's this thing, it's not like either you do something yourself or you sit here and wait for the government to hand down some good thing, right? Positive changes never happen because the government just, or almost never happen because the government just decides one day to do it. Positive changes happen because enough people band together and demand it, right? And 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 fight for it and model it in all sorts of different ways in their own lives. So, you know, whether that's the workers' rights, women's rights, gay rights, all sorts of things that have changed the lives of everyone listening to this. Think about something like the minimum wage, right? Which we now rightly take for granted. If someone wants to get rid of it, we'd regard them as barbaric, you know, someone to pay you a pound an hour, which used to happen. Um the not so long ago until 1997 um that happened because lots of ordinary workers banded together had organizations trade unions demanded it fought didn't give up you know so so individuals uh banding with other individuals create social change so there's definitely individual change that people can do in their own lives on their own and i'm in favor of also all sorts of aspects of that that i talk about in lost connections and then there's individual action banding together to create social change which is very closely related to it, I think. And I think you're right. If you don't do the individual change, if you're so depressed that you're immobilized, obviously there has to be an element of individual change or you'll never get to the social change. Mm. You know. I mean, the, the, the thing as well is nobody is coming to save you right now. You know, you can call the Samaritans if it's a really, really acute situation. There is a number for the Samaritans, which I absolutely love that the auto-reply on your Gmail has an urgent distress footer in it. Um, I thought that was a really, really nice touch. And I remember that from two years ago when I messaged you. Uh, and it has like, if you're in severe need, here's the number for, I can't remember what it was, like the Samaritans or something uh-huh. similar to that. Um, but social change takes time. Systemic change takes time. And like I say, there are things that you can do right now that will make tomorrow better. Um, so I said there was three questions. And this is the, oh, yes. this is the final one. And it might be... Okay the one that you're going to have to dip around the most. You've just finished a new book. What can you tell us? What can you tell us about the new book? Uh, almost nothing, but can I can tell, tell you... Can you tell us how long about... it's taken? Can you tell us... Yeah, t- well, because uh, the expensive bit of my books is the travel, so I tend to research quite a lot of subjects. Just as well that you got that done before now. I know, thank God. Um, so I'm, I can tell you the range... Of, so I'm, I'm writing a book about why so many people are having troubles focusing and paying attention... I'm writing a book about Las Vegas, but I can't tell you anything more than that. It's a very specific story cool. about something insane that's happening in Las Vegas, and I'm really pissed off that I'm not there at the moment because there are developments on it. But um, And uh, I'm writing a biography of the great American thinker Noam Chomsky. So uh, I'm not quite – the attention book is done, but I'm not quite sure what order or the other stuff will happen in. But, um, but yeah, that's my – that's the stuff I'm working on now. That's awesome. That's so okay. cool, man. Uh, um, Look, Johan, today's been everything that I wanted. It's definitely been worth waiting two years to finally get uh, you on. Thanks very much, Chris. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed talking to you. And thank you for engaging so deeply with the book. And I was going to say for anyone listening, if you want to, because um, people have got a lot of time stuck at home, if you want to listen to the audio of interviews with lots of the people that I've referred to, it's all on the website. So you can either, uh, if you go to thelostconnections.com, you can find out where to buy the book, the audio book, and uh, take a quiz to see how much you know about causes of depression and anxiety. But you can, more importantly, listen to for free loads of interviews with the people we've been talking about and and loads more people that we haven't mentioned. That's like the DVD extras. Uh, that's exactly what it is, yeah. That's cool as fuck. <laughs> and also, um, what's my favourite one? So I think your episode on Joe Rogan when you did Chasing the Scream, when you talked about uh, drug and alcohol problems, I think that was really super interesting. So that will be linked in the show notes below, thelostconnections.com, Johan's fantastic Instagram and his Twitter will be linked there as well. So you can go on and hassle so Just so you know, Chris, I, I know someone who knows Judy Dench. So when this is live, oh, I am going to send this. Fuck's... I'm going to say forward this to Judy. Timestamp that I... point where Chris said that he would fuck Judy Dench. That Fact. is what a way to finish this podcast. Do you have Look. any idea how happy she's going to be? She's going to be like those bonobos. <laughs> In, in the fucking Johan, no, please make it stop. Make it stop. <laughs> um, look, thanks so much for coming on, man. I really, really appreciate it. And I am not going to wait two years after your next book publishes to get you back. So I hope Brilliant. that you enjoyed it because you're coming back on soon. Cheers, Chris. Thank you so much. <laughs>